Alex, is any angle might get some weather. Pay attention. You know it is an ingo, right? Huh? Did I pronounce that right? Yeah, El Nino. Doesn't that translate as El Nino? Is that what Farley told us? You guys don't know who Farley is, do you? Do you all live powerful Farley? Do you guys don't know the same? It's too bad. Yeah, Chris. You're talking about, I just said that. Like, yeah. <laughs> Alright. What do you call a really big ant? A giant. Nicely done. I, I agree. That was good. Okay, how about this? What do you call a person who doesn't like to toot in public? Ask ass. Flagellants. Normal. What's that? A private tutor. A private tutor. Yeah. Nicely done. Let's give her a round of applause. And you guys are back. Let's give her a round of applause. Right. And you guys are getting really smart. And um, you guys are um, totally ready for this exam, I can tell. If you can answer those tough questions, you are ready. You guys want to riddle on the exam? That's yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Why not extra credit? Because that's what you guys live for. Right? Jimmy John's and extra credit. That's all I care about. Yeah, we were sponsored by Jimmy John's, so I had to, I had to mention that. Hey, there's an idea. We could have our lecture sponsored. Huh. Extra resource source of revenue. Wouldn't that be awesome if we had Jimmy John's right now? Yes. Now these are recorded, you could actually put a little banner at the bottom, like NASCAR style, I could just like wrap myself in John the Juice and Jimmy John, Taco Bell and Mountain Dew, and Jesus. Alright, we should get serious. But I have a little too much fun. Okay, here is homework for you on a serious note. We are serious people. I have my serious tie on today. I was in a goofy mood, so I figured I'd dress serious and then it calm me down a little bit. <laughs> that is actually the story around the tie, if you're curious. When I started teaching <clears throat> at the university, this, this time around, like uh, eight years ago, I walked in the classroom, probably dressed not too similar to most of you, and, Start getting set up, and someone's like, um, "So, where's the professor?" I'm like, uh, "I am." <laughs> so then the next day, I actually wore a tie, and then they they actually believed me. <laughs> so I wear a tie ever since then. Helps me uh, focus and not be so corny, because you guys know how bad it could get. You've seen it. All right. So <clears throat> homework. I'm a little excited about this storm. I can't I can't really focus on anything else right now. Blood track mine, I know. <clears throat> All right. If you can draw a sarcomere and label these structures, you're looking pretty good. Okay? So I want you to practice this. In the SI sessions, this would be sort of a nice activity to come prepared with. Maybe draw it out. Or <clears throat> in, in the SI session, you might be asked to get in groups and draw it. Okay? Now remember, the drawing is going to look something like this. So the first part of today is going to be review. We're going to go over this concept that we looked at before. Um, and so I'm trying to just refresh your memory of the architectural organization of, of the sarcomere. So here's our Z disc to Z disc. Oh. Man, I'm all, I'm all discombobulated. And um, this is our functional unit of the sarcomere, right? Our functional unit of muscle called the sarcomere. We've got our thick filament, and we have our thin filament. Now, our thick filament, don't be confused by this. The thick filament is only made up of one protein. What is it? Myosin. And the myosin has these little globular heads that we looked at in that video last time. And the thin filament is made up of three individual proteins, most of which is what 
protein. Actin. But it also has two other proteins known as? Troponin. Troponin and? Tropomyosin. Nicely done. Okay. How about this question here? Um, this specific part of the sarcomere structure that is only occupied by thick filaments as in lighter in color than the rest of that particular band is called what? H zone. A band, H zone, Z disc, I band, or two of the above? B. B, H zone. Very good. So if you go back to the H band or the H zone, that's right here. Okay? Band and zone. I, I won't put on the exam H zone and H band and be like, ooh, which one is it, right? So I won't, I won't confuse you. There's two kind of nomenclatures for that. Okay, let's go back and talk review-wise about excitation contraction coupling. So in this, a different way to look at this material that we've already covered, again, this is review, but if you, if you haven't picked up on it, for the exam, we might have a riddle, okay? We might have um, 50 multiple choice questions. We might have some figures up on the screen and maybe think in the lecture today, what possible figures could those be? Because they're usually figures you've seen before that we've talked about in class, right? And I ask, hey, what's the yellow arrow pointing to? Or what's the green arrow pointing to? Um, but you're also going to have a probably some sort of... Uh, 60 percentish is going to be muscle fizz. We spend more of our time in muscle physiology. And then maybe like 30 percent to 35 percent will be peripheral nervous system. Remember back to like reflexes and we looked at things like uh, somatic reflexes and visceral reflexes. And then, um, and then there's 5 to 10 percent review. So if I had to prioritize, I'd probably put it in that order. Your, your time, your study time. Okay? Um, there's lots of possible questions that we can ask about excitation contraction coupling. Because that's, that's, that's a statement that says it's the whole thing. So the, the four main phases, doesn't this look like a possible multiple choice question? <laughs> so the four main phases of contraction and relaxation, we've got excitation, then excitation contraction coupling, then the contraction, and then the relaxation. In the excitation, this is where you've got action potential. Excitation is the electrical signal coming down the nerve. The excitation contraction coupling is linking the electrical signal, the action potential, to the membrane of the muscle, known as the sarcolemma, and thereby activating the myofilaments, getting them ready to contract. And what is the key molecule that's important for coupling those events? Calcium, thank you. Okay? There's another molecule that might be important as well. It would be a neurotransmitter. And, and which one is that? Acetylcholine. Right? And you guys can think about what that you're, oh yeah, that's right. Because there's this synaptic cleft, and you've got to get the signal across the gap. The contraction, this is where the muscle fiber um, shortens, and it, uh, it develops tension. The sarcomere contracts. And then relaxation is when it needs to relax and go back to its resting length. So if we take a look at each of these steps again in sequence, that's a bad sign when that happens, that little pop. Mm -hmm. I don't know why it is there. Hmm. Patty gave me a backup mic though. She doesn't trust me. But I think we're good for now. Okay, so these are the same pictures that we looked at before, but they're in much bigger view. So they're easier to see. So if I was studying these, I would probably focus on these pictures from this lecture versus the one that we did on Tuesday. Because the one that we did on Tuesday were about, you know, what, 25% the size of these guys? These guys occupy the entire screen, and those guys were like up in this right-hand corner. So if you look carefully, there's some of the same pictures. So step one, we've got our um, nerve signal coming down. The nerve signal... Um, is uh, opening uh, voltage-gated uh, calcium channels that are in the synaptic knob. And as calcium enters the synaptic knob, it stimulates exocytosis of the acetylcholine. So that's 
the step that causes the acetylcholine to move and the vesicle to fuse. We didn't talk about that part yet. So same pictures, we're going to add a few more steps of detail than what we talked about on Tuesday. So if you're like, I don't remember talking about that, we didn't. We didn't talk yet about voltage-gated calcium channels opening and then calcium coming in and this causing this step where you've got the membranes fusing, right? These vesicle membranes fusing with the um, uh, knob terminal. Then <clears throat> acetylcholine is dumped into the cleft. And then this little box, this rectangular box, is blown up in higher view right here. And that's showing you uh, what these purplish-looking acetylcholine receptors look like. And there's a, a channel down the middle, and when two bind, the channel opens. So here we've got a higher view of that same diagram. right? So that's this little diagram right here is now over here, step number three. We've got two acetylcholine molecules binding to the receptor, and now that opens up these channels that allow for sodium to flow in and potassium to flow out. It's not specific. The sodium that enters comes in more quickly, um, velocity-wise, and it shifts the resting membrane potential from about minus 90 millivolts is the resting membrane potential in the um, muscle side. And that's different than what we saw with the nerve, right? So there's one difference. The nerve, the resting membrane potential of the nerve that we left in the last unit was what? Minus 70. Minus 70, okay? So some unique differences here. This is minus 90. It goes up to plus 75. Uh, in the nerve, it went up to only about plus 55. And then you've got... Um, Potassium exiting and resting membrane potential returns back to minus 90. But this quick voltage shift is what we call our end plate potential. End plate potential. We talked about it last time. The motor end plate is this muscle, and the end plate potential, the EPP, is this electrical voltage signal now that's on the muscle side of the neuromuscular junction. Okay, still uh, keeping in theme with the review, similar uh, slide that we saw before. This voltage change, this end plate potential, now stimulates these two channels to open sequentially. First, we get the sodium channel enter opening, then we get our potassium slower channel, voltage-gated opening. The uh, sodium rushes in, uh, this creates a action potential that continues down the membrane. Right? It moves down this membrane surface until it gets to this little pothole. Right? And that dives deep within to the belly of the cell so that that electrical signal can be nearby where calcium is being stored. And calcium is being stored in this sarcoplasmic reticulum. Specifically, this part of the sarcoplasmic reticulum is known as the terminal cistern. Okay? Is this all making sense? <laughs> now, when the action potential spreads down into the T-tubule, and again, the T-tubule with the two terminal cisterna on either side is referred to as a triad. The triad. You'll probably see this in the worksheet, maybe in the quiz. You'll definitely see this in the reading. <coughs> and as this action potential moves down, it triggers voltage-gated calcium channels in the um, uh, <clears throat> sarcoplasmic particulum to open, and this allows calcium to flood into the cytosol of the muscle cell. And now it's readily available to bind to what molecule? Troponin. Troponin. Nicely done. So that's going to be our next slide, right? So our next slide is showing where the calcium ends up. Here's our troponin molecule. We have calcium binding here, calcium binding here. Uh, this is the thin filament. This whole structure is the thin filament. You can see how this uh, circle is circumscribing the entire filament. And, uh, but of the thin filament, uh, calcium binds specifically to troponin, which is physically attached to tropomyosin. And as this binding takes place, then it causes a shift in those two proteins. And you can kind of see the arrows moving in their respective directions, exposing these binding sites. 
those binding sites, or otherwise known as active sites, are um, recognized and have a high affinity for the myosin data. And the next slide is going to show what happens with this interaction between the myosin head and the thin filament. So, within the myosin head, we have an enzyme known as myosin ATPase. This myosin ATPase is what hydrolyzes ATP. So, ATP has its adenosine triphosphate, so it has three phosphate molecules. If you lose one of them, it's called adenosine diphosphate. If you lose another one, it's called adenosine monophosphate. Then you can add back another phosphate, make it ADP, and add back a third phosphate and make it ATP. <coughs> and so this is how the recycling takes place. And if you remember the video, the video showed you how quickly this takes place. right? And if you remember the introductor, uh, introduction to this lecture segment, I talked about if you s spend a little time thinking about how much ATP you need in order to maintain breathing, cardiac respirations, or cardiac um, uh, cycles, uh, respiratory breathing, uh, motions of, of walking or locomotion, um, even peristaltic movements of smooth muscle that we'll talk about later in the lecture, you're consuming a tremendous amount of ATP on a daily basis. Right? So this myosin ATPase enzyme hydrolyzes the ATP molecule, and it takes the ATP molecule into an ADP with sort of a free hanging out phosphate. And this is the cocking phase of that head. And as it cocks back, it allows it to appropriately interact with the binding site. And the head attaches. The head attaches uh, when it's in this cocked format. And this is what we call our cross bridge cross bridge formation, which should make sense, right? They're linked. Now, the, um, we're down here, and then we move up here. The myosin head releases ADP and PI, and that causes this power stroke as that energy is liberated. So as it moves from the cock position forward, you can see the ADP and the PI come off. Now, it's left with the firing, fired position with no energy bound to it. When you bind a new ATP, this new ATP molecule, when it hits the head and binds, it causes a slight conformational change in the myosin head, and that's just enough to have it fall out of the active site. Does that make sense? So the binding of ATP is what releases it away from the active binding site. And we talked about how if you don't have more ATP, you get stuck in this format. We can refer to that clinically as rigor mortis. Right? So it should make sense that calcium uh, becomes available. They, they, they bind. Any ATP that was bound to the head is actually going to be used to fire the power stroke, but now no new ATP is going to show up, so it won't actually detach. So <clears throat> Once the binding of ATP happens, then the myosin releases the active molecule. And the process is repeated if there is more ATP and if calcium is still readily available inside the cell. Right? Each head can perform five power strokes per second. Five power strokes per second. So that's a complete cycle, right? This is, this is one. That would be two. That would be three, four, and five in one second. Okay? That's about the average of what your muscles can do. So each stroke is going to consume. There's a question at the very end of the lecture. There's a question that happened last time. How, how much ATP is being used? So I want to be clear that one complete cycle uses one molecule of ATP from start to finish. So if we want to relax now, so this is review. We peppered in a few extra little details, but all the pictures are the same pictures as last time. So this is really the third time we've gone over this 
entire thing. You with me? So if it's still not making sense, then you know you've got some work to do with SI or studying and, and kind of work out those kinks. Now, if we want to relax the muscle and keep it from firing, <coughs> then you need to stop first the nerve stimulation because if you're sending the signal, you're releasing acetylcholine and you're making calcium available inside the cell, you're putting it in a situation where it's going to contract or you're going to have cross bridge formation at the very least. So you stop the nerve stimulation, acetylcholine esterase is released by the um, uh, synaptic knob and this comes in and breaks down uh, acetylcholine. As it breaks down acetylcholine, um, those parts are reabsorbed and you can remanufacture acetylcholine and put it into a vesicle on the presynaptic side. So now you no longer have acetylcholine stimulation. But this is not the place that it stops from a relaxation. In addition, you start pumping calcium out of the inside of the muscle cell back into the sarcoplasmic reticulum. And you do this by active transport. This is also an energy requiring process that we talked about. So you can see this picture where calcium is moving back into, the, in this figure it's showing it primarily in the um, terminal cisternae. But here's, a, here's one right here. It looks like one's going here. Here's one right here that's in maybe the main part of the sarcoplasmic reticulum. Okay, but the terminal cisternae and the sarcoplasmic reticulum are really the same thing. It's just the terminal cisternae is a specific part of the sarcoplasmic reticulum. So calcium binds in the SR to a molecule known as calcequestrin, uh, which has a high affinity for calcium, and so it helps to encourage it to rush back in. Um, and again, I said you needed ATP in order for this to take place. So if we look at what's going on with um, uh, relaxation, calcium removed from troponin because it's pumped back into the SR, sarcoplasmic reticulum. The tropomyosin now reblocks the active sites, and uh, the muscle fiber no longer produces tension, and it returns to resting length. And a lot of that is due to this elastic recoil nature of that elastic filament, known as Titan. And then I also said that you know the role that we describe in this course that Titan plays is actually that's it. That's all we say. And you know there's a lot more going on with Titan, but in a 200 level class, you know this is a lot for us to be digesting. Okay. Questions over excitation contraction coupling. So we just walked through kind of the whole thing one more time. So calcium is just constantly getting recycled? Yep. Being... Okay. Calcium is constantly being recycled. That's a good question. It's being released into the cell insides, the cytoplasm, and then it's being re-sequestered back into the SR. And then it's being released again. And then it's being re-sequestered. Now, there are times where it'll get um, lost outside of the cell, and you might need to bring more calcium into the cell. Uh, and if you needed a source of calcium, because you're running low on your reserves inside the muscle cell, where might you find in the body a large deposition of calcium? <coughs> Bone. Remember that? And what cells would you potentially stimulate in order to make calcium more available. Osteoclasts. Osteoclasts. Wow. That's, look out if you guys just learned something and remembered it. That's, that's good. That's wonderful. All right? So that's a type of, you know, maybe review question that could show up on Tuesday. Right? It's, it's connecting the dots. Because remember, when we go through the skeletal system, and we like to finish the chapter and wash our hands of it and say, oh, I'm done with that. But uh, the skeletal system sees the vasculature. The vasculature uses the skeletal system. And the muscles even use the skeletal system. Right? The skeletal system and the skin are intimately connected. You're like, what? You don't remember how we talked about vitamin D synthesis? And vitamin D is actually important for um, encouraging your gut to reabsorb calcium. So if you want calcium and uh, bring it in out of the diet, you need vitamin D to do that. 
So all of these systems are interconnected. Yes? Um, did you say that the ACH enzyme came from the synaptic knob? Yes. Okay. Yep. Acetylcholine esterase comes out of the uh, synaptic knob. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> The next little segment is on the dynamics of, of muscle. Yes? Yeah, we're going to get to that right now. That's actually a really good transition. Muscle spasms. Um, we're, we're, we're like only two slides away from muscle spasms. That's pretty cool. Okay. Um, so the dynamics of muscle physiology. Now that you know how it works, Right? And, and a lot of that mechanism, that physiology, you never covered in lab. Right? Excitation contraction coupling. It's, it's not a lab topic. That is a lecture topic. Right? That's where we get into the mechanism or the physiology. So the other thing that you didn't really cover in, in lab is, is shown on the screen right here. Right? So this is um, a graph that's showing the tension as it relates to the length. So it's called the length tension relationship. And you can see this little diagram. So we've got the length of the sarcomere on the uh, x-axis. And on the y-axis, we have the amount of tension that is being generated. And what I want you to be able to appreciate is that there is an optimal amount of tension. So where tension is the highest, there is a certain range of length of the sarcomere. And the way that we're designed anatomically is our optimal tension generation capability is found within sort of a normal range of motion, conveniently. Right? So the things that you do like this, right, in this space, is where those moment of inertias, those angles, those moment arms are optimized, and the greatest amount of tension can be generated. But like when you're way out here, like you're reaching in the back seat to grab your backpack, that's a little bit of a stretch, and, and it's a little harder to lift in that way. Okay, but if you, if you grab your backpack like right here and you pull it up like so, you can lift a lot more weight. So kind of our normal everyday range of motions is where we optimize the resting length of our sarcomere at the level of the microanatomy. And when you have that, you have the greatest overlap between actin and myosin, or the thick and the thin filament. <clears throat> and if you have the most optimized amount of overlap, you have the greatest ability for cross bridges to form. And the more cross bridges that can form, the more tension you can generate. And so if you overstretch the muscle, kind of like that back seat backpack example, you're still going to have some cross bridge formation capability, but you're not going to have as many because look at all these over here on the very edges that aren't being utilized. And so the amount of tension drops off as you further stretch out the sarcomere. Likewise, if you overcrowd the sarcomere, you get some um, bunching up or some overcrowding, and there are some cross bridges that aren't formed because you're not efficiently using the architecture. Okay. Now, there's also a second relationship that's worth mentioning, and this is the cross-sectional area versus force relationship. So I'm just going to tell you that the area is proportional to the force. So the greater the, the cross-sectional area of the muscle, the greater the force. In other words, the bigger the muscle, the greater the force, which is kind of intuitive. So this cross-sectional area of force relationship would kind of look like a, like a directly proportional line. So if you had the amount of force generated here, and you had uh, the cross-sectional area on the x-axis, you'd have a line that went like this. It would be a direct relationship. Larger the muscle, cross-sectional area, the larger the force is being produced. And, and, and that's sort of obvious, I think. Now, what's a little less obvious is this question that was posed that talks about um, uh, causing muscle spasms or twitches. And the word twitch is a word that refers to a single firing of an action potential. So it has a very specific electrophysiology term meaning when you say the word twitch. So a muscle twitch means that 
there is a contraction event of a muscle caused by a single action potential. And you're seeing on this side of, of the slide a threshold. We've got a stimulus 1 and a stimulus 2 that are not large enough to trigger an action potential. So they'd be considered what? Local potentials. Nicely done. And then 3, 4, 5 on up are all at threshold stimulating the contraction or an action potential that's going to lead to a contraction event. If you look down here, this is a little probably hard to see. It might be easier to see on the far right, there's more red dots filled in. And on the far left, there's none in the back. I don't know. If you print it out in black and white, you probably can't tell. But these are corresponding to the graph above it, as is the tension that's on the bottom. So all of this is in line, where you've got the one here and the two, where there's no action potential. And you can see there's no tension being generated. And there's no individual muscle fiber that's actually been caused to fire, or there's no muscle twitch. And then when you get to three, you get a little bit of a blip, and there's one red dot in the middle. When you get to four, you get two fibers that are stimulated to contract, and the tension that's produced is a little bit greater. And you can see when you peak out at maximum contraction, you're actually up here with your uh, stimulus voltage, and you've recruited all of the muscle fibers within that, or all of the nerve fibers within that um, nerve. Okay, so this is our action potential, this is our nerve schematic, and this is the response of the muscle. And so you can kind of appreciate that you can have smaller amounts of tension or larger amounts of tension. Now, how do we do that? Well, the way that we do that is actually shown on the far right. So if we look at an individual muscle twitch... It's shown in this graph with the electrical signal, okay? And if we look at this response over here, this response is known as trepe. And the trepe is what we call a staircase phenomenon, where we've got the ability for the stimulus to build on top of each other. And so at a moderate frequency of stimulation, we have not enough time for, um, or we have enough time for the muscle to fully relax between contractions. But as we, so we come up, it fully relaxes all the way to the bottom. We come up, fully relaxes to the bottom. But it staircases because as we stimulate it repetitively, it grows in the amount or the uh, magnitude of the twitch. Now, another way that we can generate increasing tension is, is what we call incomplete tetanus. So in incomplete tetanus, this is another way to wave summate or add them together. But the difference between the staircase phenomenon or trepe is we don't have enough time in between successive muscle twitches to fully relax back down the baseline. And so you start getting this staircase phenomenon both on the stimulus as well as the relaxation. Now, the force continues to build like you saw here, but what will happen is you can't keep this up. And eventually, you're going to lead into what we call complete tetanus. Complete tetanus. Or where you lose the ability to continue to fire at a greater frequency. So the higher stimulus frequency um, at complete tetanus, there's no ability to relax in between um, muscle stimuli, and it's in a state of continual contraction, otherwise known as a spasm. And you can see how that is produced right here. Has anybody ever had like a, a, a calf cramp? Yeah. Right? And um, I mean, they really hurt, right? It's like it takes a grown man down to their you know, their knees. It's kind of amazing. Um, but what's happening is the muscle is frozen in a contractile state. And 
it won't be able to maintain that forever. You'll actually have some failure point or some fatigue that will happen or take place. Okay, so these are the different ways that you can generate force and build upon it successfully within a muscle. Now, if we look at other types of dynamics of the muscle, we need to characterize isotonic versus isometric <coughs> contraction. So, isometric develops tension without changing length. So, iso meaning same, metric referring to the length. So, an isometric Contraction is a contraction where you have tension that's being generated, but the muscle doesn't change length. So it's like pushing up against the wall, right? So you're pushing up against the wall. The muscle's not necessarily changing length, but there's tension that's being produced as I push on the wall. Uh, going back to the building uh, actions, uh, would that be a form of seizures? Now, so seizures are, are usually neuronal. Right? So like if you're talking about a seizure within a patient, then you're talking about something that's going on in the central nervous system. And um, so the stimulus is usually a neuronal stimulus. And the output is going to be potentially muscle spasms, but it's because the neurons are saying that contract or fire. Excellent. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. So the contraction that we have here is a force over a length. Right? Force over a length. Isometric means you generate tension within the muscle without changing the length. And isotonic, isotonic means that um, you're going to uh, keep the same amount of force, but you're going to change um, the length over time. And we have two different types of isotonic. We have concentric and eccentric. Concentric is generating tension or force in a muscle while you're shortening the length in the muscle. So in, in the gym, that would be like a bicep curl on the upstroke. upstroke. And um, eccentric would be a bicep extension as you control the rate of drop. Right. So you're generating tension while you're lengthening the muscle. And so concentric activity is... Uh, exercising the muscle while it's shortening, and eccentric is exercising the muscle while it's lengthening. And so a lot of trainers, when they want to mix it up, right, they'll mix up between concentric activity and eccentric activity to actually train the muscle in, in the upstroke and the downstroke. Okay, and you can really work the muscle that way. A lot of times you need to rest in between that. But there's actually a professor who's retired now uh, from NAU, and um, he built an eccentric um, bicycle for basically for physical therapy and rehabilitation of patients. And it was a recumbent bike, and it was an eccentric stimulus. And he was able to demonstrate, uh, and they sell this product now. This is Dr. Lindstedt. He was able to demonstrate that um, patients had a greater strength improvement with physical therapy on this recumbent exercise bike than they did with a standard concentric exercise bike. And so there's a lot of, you know, in exercise phys, there's a lot of training ideas around eccentric contractions and training on the eccentric side, and this is why. So here you got some pictures. Isometric is like holding the dumbbell in one location. So you're generating tension, but it doesn't move. And then isotonic, Concentric is on the upstroke, and isotonic uh, eccentric is on the downstroke, but it's a controlled drop. Where does the energy come from? We talked about, and hopefully I convinced you with that um, video, that the amount of energy that's being used and expended just to get muscle contraction is quite dramatic. And so we have to start thinking about where do we get the energy? Where does the ATP come from? Yes? Can you be able to define isotonic one more time real quick? Isotonic, yeah. So isometric is you're generating um, force while not changing the length of the muscle. That's isometric. Isotonic is you generate consistent force, but you change the length of the muscle. Okay? Good question. 
The um, first source of energy, if you remember back to sort of the beginning of the lecture within this semester, we um, talked about two forms of energy production. We talked about aerobic and anaerobic. Anaerobic meaning without oxygen, and aerobic meaning with oxygen. So, the first source that we want to look at isn't necessarily glycolysis. Um, glycolysis is a early source, but the very first source uh, is, is actually referring to um, uh, within the first 10 seconds. And these actually come from um, the donations of phosphate. These are immediate demands of energy. So you don't need oxygen for this to manufacture it, but you only produce a little bit of ATP. And so where do you get it from? Well, you've got within the muscle uh, an enzyme known as myokinase. And myokinase can actually um, uh, strip from an ADP it makes an AMP, so a diphosphate to a mono. It takes this phosphate and adds it to another ADP and creates ATP. So myokinase, which is found within the muscle, uh, can create a very quick, for like <coughs> sprinting type of activities in the first 10 seconds, energy in the form of ATP by stripping phosphate from one. It's like robbing Peter to pay Paul. Well, the other thing that can be done is using creatine kinase. Now, creatine kinase does a similar type of thing. So, creatine kinase is ultimately going to form quick energy, like in the form of ATP. It's going to take it from creatine phosphate, strip the phosphate off of it, and add it to an ADP. You're left with creatine, and then your product is ATP. Okay, so you, you've seen a lot of these supplements that are loaded with creatine phosphate, right? And, and, and bodybuilders or sprinters will take these supplements. So is, is, there, a, um, is there evidence suggested that they work? Yeah, absolutely. Um, they work to a certain extent. Um, but once you burn up that energy, and it's only for short bursts. So is it going to help uh, maybe a bodybuilder get through another repetition? Maybe so. Is it going to make you run the mile better? Not necessarily. Okay? If you run the mile in less than 10 seconds, you probably don't need anything to help you. Okay? <laughs> Besides, you're a freak, because nobody can do that. Okay? But you're an impressive freak, and you should call Guinness. So creatine phosphate, um, using creatine kinase, can add another source of quick energy. And so if we look at these... Um, immediate demands, they're phosphate donations. They're stripping phosphates from one to add it to an ADP to make an ATP. Now, we've got our <clears throat> um, first 10 seconds, which is our uh, phosphagen system. Okay? Um, and our phosphagen system is going to deplete after about 10 seconds. Now, for the first um, zero to um, about 40 seconds, you're going to have the, uh, the, the phosphagen system that we just talked about, and you're going to have glycolysis. And glycolysis is going to come up kind of like this and then sort of drop down. Anything after 40 seconds is actually going to be aerobic respiration. So long-term energy is anything after 40 seconds. Okay, that's a good rule of thumb. So if the sprint activity is a 40-second bout, then you probably won't really ever utilize aerobic respiration during that exercise event. You'll use it after the fact, and I'll explain why here later, because you have to replenish that ATP that you stripped. Right? So that's why when you're done exercising and sprinting, right? It's not, you're breathing hard. And you don't stop breathing hard. It's like you're still breathing hard even though you're not running. And that's that oxygen death. But aerobic respiration kicks in later, after 40 seconds. So we've talked an awful lot about uh, skeletal muscle. And skeletal muscle is the main focus. There's no question about that. But there are some parallels between skeletal and cardiac and skeletal and smooth. And so we're going to compare and contrast for a bit. 
cardiac versus smooth muscle. And a lot of this is going to be putting things together that we've already talked about, like kind of concluding. So the muscles themselves, in order to actually work, they have to shorten or contract. That's how they operate. And they're specialized in order to do that. They're cellular rich, and they're very well vascularized so that they can have blood flow uh, to allow for ATP to get there and oxygen to be available for the production of future ATP for activities beyond 40 seconds. These cells are elongated cells. So if we drew a typical cell, like a circle, these cells don't look like a circle, right? They're nice, long cylinders. But they have all the usual organelles. They've got um, cytoskeletal proteins, just like all other cells have. But they're specialized and organized in a very rigid pattern in order to achieve their activity. Um, we're going to look at smooth and cardiac right now and kind of compare and contrast it to skeletal. So first up is skeletal. These are the type of pictures that should be a little familiar to you because we looked at them at the very beginning of the semester in lab. This is skeletal muscle on the far right. And just to kind of bring this full circle, can you appreciate the banding that's being seen right here? Mm -hmm. So this is that banding pattern that we were talking about. You're seeing the architecture of the thick and the thin filaments as they overlap. And that's what this striations are, right? So it's kind of cool to understand, okay, yeah, sure, I wrote down striated on my first practical within lab. I didn't really know what that meant other than it looked kind of like a zebra. Now you sort of know why it looks that way. That's the architecture. That's the microarchitecture. We know that they're multinucleated, right? Here's a nucleus right here. Here's another nucleus down here. This is all one cell, right? Here's another cell, nucleus, 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 not in the plane of focus. Here's another cell, nucleus, 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 nucleus. No, that's on the other one. Okay? Multinucleated. They attach to bones via tendons, and they're under voluntary control. Now, let's compare that to cardiac muscle. Cardiac muscle is under involuntary control. It's branched. It has a single nucleus, which is different. It still is striated. You can still see the striations. It's organized very similarly to skeletal muscle. And the one thing that's unique is it has these intercalated discs. Remember these intercalated discs? That's you, those are those dark bands that you see right here that do not show up here. There's no dark bands. Here they're dark bands. Branch meaning that the cells don't keep going in one straight architecture, they kind of go here, and this one kind of dives down, and dives down again. So that's what they mean by branched. It's not nice and parallel like it is in skeletal muscle. Those intercalated discs allow for the electrical signal from one cell to communicate with the adjacent <coughs> cell. The intercalated discs actually facilitate the electrical signaling from one cell to another. You'll learn a lot more about cardiac muscle in 202. Now, smooth muscle. Smooth muscle is under involuntary control. It allows for slow, sustained contractions. So unlike skeletal cardiac, it actually is a more slow, methodical type of contraction. It's more of a contraction that comes in on a wave and then subsides. Whereas a cardiac muscle contracts forcefully and relaxes as it beats, right? And cardiac, or skeletal muscle also does that. Now, we can have slower motions, like, you know, if you're dancing or you're doing an athletic event where there's a fluid motion. It doesn't have to be all abrupt robotic movements. But smooth muscle is only capable of slow, sustained contractions. It's uninucleated. It's fusiform, which is a word that means, like, spindle shape. Spindle shape is thin on the ends and kind of fat, bulgy in the middle. And there's no visible striations because of the way it's organized. And I'm going to show you why that is. There is still actin and myosin in smooth muscle. It's just organized in a very different architectural pattern than what we see with skeletal and cardiac. So 
If we um, go back to uh, cardiac muscle, and we talk a little bit about its specialization, we, I had talked about this earlier in this lecture series. It doesn't require nerve stimulation for contraction, so it's autorhythmic. It has its own natural pacemaker within the cell, uh, within the or uh, organ, excuse me. And those pacemaker cells are located in nodes. Uh, the beginning is called the SA node, and then it moves its way through the heart to the AV node and to this Purkinje network, which are just nerve fibers that go throughout the different chambers of the heart in a sequential path. And we'll talk more about that in 202, but this is setting the stage for you uh, so that when you see cardiac muscle next semester, you kind of understand what some of these terminologies are referring to. Um, it is almost exclusively using aerobic respiration, right? Because hopefully its activity is longer than 40 seconds, okay? Now, what's interesting, uh, you may cover this in 202, but you'll definitely cover it in pathology if you come back and take pathology with me. Um, one of the things that happens post-infarct after a heart attack is when a, a, a blockage of a vessel takes place and distal or downstream blood flow is restricted, there's a region of the heart that becomes ischemic without oxygen, without blood flow. And so there's no ability for aerobic respiration. So what the uh, heart does is it tries to convert and start using glycolysis. And so one of the um, uh, blood panels that will run post-infarct is we look at lactate dehydrogenase levels in the patient. And if they're elevated, that usually is an indication that there was a myocardial infarction or a heart attack because there's this lactate dehydrogenase that's specific for myocardium that's in upregulated. And that's one of our blood panels that we look to see. We also look at, you'll like this, we look at a special type of troponin. Because when there's an infarct, that troponin molecule, which is very delicate, also becomes liberated. And so we'll look at what we call TNT levels. Troponin T. We look at T, troponin T and lactate dehydrogenase levels in a blood draw from a patient post-infarct. And you can get an indication of about when the heart attack took place. Like, oh, I don't think it was actually last night. These elevated levels look like they took place maybe over the weekend. Oh, wow. Okay, so that's how we, that's how we, knowing what we know, we can use some of this biochemistry to our advantage and find out what is it that's going on in this particular patient. So, these guys are non-mitotic, and um, a terminology that we like to use is the central dogma. Do you guys know what that word means? The central dogma is sort of the normal way of thinking about things. So this is the conventional wisdom is another way of saying it. So the convention that we say is the central dogma. The most well-accepted idea is that these cells, once they're dead, they don't divide and they don't replace themselves. That's why if you have a patient with a heart attack, that region that's scarred is never going to come back. Okay. What is so special about smooth muscle? Now, I said that smooth muscle is uniquely different because in smooth muscle, um, we don't see the same type of architecture. It doesn't have visible striations. Um, you don't see Z-discs in T-tubules. Okay? So, where does the calcium come from? It comes from the interstitium, from the outside, from the interstitial fluid. It still has actin and myosin, but they're in a very different organization. The shape that, that takes place is more fusiform. So you can see this is labeled the actin filament, and the thick purple is labeled as the myosin. So there's still actin and myosin that create overlap, but because they're organized sort of in this branching network, you don't see a striated pattern. And the fusiform, can you appreciate, these are two cells. Here's one right here, I'll trace it. And then here's the second one down here. And this is it in a relaxed state, and this is over here in a contracted state. Okay, So it definitely contracts. It kind of bunches up as it contracts. These guys can definitely go through mitosis and divide, which is very different than what we talked about with 
cardiac muscle. And the types of smooth muscle are really twofold. We've got multi-unit and we have single unit. The multi-unit are usually things like found in larger arteries, pulmonary airways, the iris of the eye, and even the erector pili muscles that control the muscle around the hair on your skin. So in um, multi-unit, the muscle fibers are um, uh, structurally independent of each other. They can do their own thing. So it receives its own nerve supply. So that's this picture right here. So here you can see these on and on nerve fibers coming in and each one of them having a, a, a different synapse onto the individual smooth muscle. Over in single unit, this side over here, this is a single nerve fiber that comes in and controls this grouping of smooth muscles. So this is what you're going to find more in visceral muscle, like in the gut, in the abdomen. Um, the, the cells are all going to contract together in unison, in a, like a single cell would. And this is the architecture that most of the smooth muscle in the body follows, is this single unit. Now if we look at um, the different types of features within smooth muscle, where can, we can make some comparisons to our skeletal muscle that we learned about. These guys can actually contract without a nerve stimulus. Um, they can actually be innervated or stimulated by hormones. They can be innervated or stimulated by carbon dioxide levels. Right? That can actually cause a vasodilatory or a vasoconstrictive um, activity. They can be uh, influenced by pH levels, lack of oxygen, or even a stretch reflex. We saw the stretch reflex in that maturition reflex. You guys remember that? That maturition reflex was a type of autonomic reflex arc that we looked at in the very beginning of this unit, and that's the bladder, right? And that stretch reflex caused a trigger of an action potential, but that stretch reflex stimulated it to want to contract. But it also has autonomic nervous system innervation, and that's what's shown right here. The varicosities, the varicosities are where the um, synaptic vesicles are stored. And you can see here's an automatic nerve fiber coming in, and all these little bumps are the varicosities that have the um, uh, neurotransmitter within them. And then the diffuse junction, the diffuse junctions act like the synaptic cleft in the muscle. And the diffuse junction is going to be between the varicosity and the actual muscle fiber itself, or muscle cell. So, when the smooth muscle cells contract, right, they go from a relaxed state that we already showed to a contracted state. And we've got calcium gates that are located on the plasma membrane. So the calcium that comes in is from outside the cell. So the calcium gates are on the plasma membrane. They open, allow calcium to flow in. Calcium can find its binding site, right? And its binding site is called calmodulin in smooth muscle instead of troponin. So calmodulin is the smooth muscle cell equivalent of troponin. That's what calcium binds to in a smooth muscle. It has what we refer to as a um, long latent period. That's the period of time or the interval between the action potential and the initiation of contraction. So if you will, this would be sort of the excitation contraction coupling time, the latency period, where you say contract with the signal, and it's between that time when calcium comes in, finds calmodulin, and then allows for actin and myosin to see each other. That's the latency period. So it's very, very long with smooth muscle. That's why smooth muscle doesn't contract really fast. It takes time. It has a slow contraction phase, so it actually takes a while for it to contract and it takes a while for it to relax. So let's think about why that is. Cardiac muscle makes sense that it would be quick. 
Skeletal muscle makes sense that it'll be quick if you need to run away from a bear. Okay? With smooth muscle, it's usually found in, well, in, the, in the lining of a blood vessel. It's found in the GI tract. And so in the GI tract, if you're moving food through the GI tract, do you want to shoot it through as fast as you possibly can? No. Okay? It would be very, very um, inconvenient for life. But also, you would not be able to have time to absorb nutrition. So you want to actually move it very, very slow as it works its way through. Okay? So it makes a lot of sense, the way it's designed, because of the way it works. When you think about what it's for, um, then the architecture makes sense. Okay, so let's talk about a couple of possible questions. In 1997, we had a runner that set the world record for the 800 meter dash, one minute and 42.67 seconds. As he was finishing his race, I want you to uh, tell me what energy source predominated in fueling his leg muscles. Another way of saying that, what was the main energy source? Creatine kinase and phosphogen borrowing, glycogen stores, aerobically generated ATP, or ATP generated using myoglobin oxygen? C, aerobically generated, how do you know? That's more than 40 seconds, okay, good job. Very good. Okay, how about this one? This is a picture of what type of contraction? Isotonic and concentric, isotonic and eccentric, Isometric, or you're clueless at this point. A, isotonic and concentric, why? It's flexion, so it's generating force while your muscle is shortening. Very nicely done. All right, some of you uh, work in this environment. This is a picture of what type of contraction, hopefully, otherwise the food goes everywhere. Isotonic and concentric, isotonic and eccentric, isometric, or no clue. C, isometric, very good. Okay, some of you, uh, just somebody in this class, but they don't have the red tank top on today, so don't worry, you won't recognize them. I'm kidding, it's not from this class. It's from like 1982. Can't you tell by the shorts? Okay, um, so in this exercise, it's still fashionable, even though the shorts are. This is what type of contraction? Isotonic and concentric, isometric, so it, it's... It's really this motion that I'm talking about is from here to here. Okay? What is it? Isotonic to concentric, isotonic and eccentric, isometric or no clue? B, isotonic and eccentric. Very good. Questions? Okay, this is where we're going to stop. Okay? We're going to stop here for the exam. Um, it's a nice place to stop, and I'm going to pick up with this last little segment when we get back from Thanksgiving, okay? All right, I'll see you guys on Tuesday.